Um, welcome everybody to this Home Gardens for Resilience and Recovery webinar, HG4RR. Today we have two excellent speakers and I'm very glad that they uh, could join us even though we're starting slightly uh, late. We will hear two uh, presentations about home garden interventions in rural Tanzania and then we will still have some time for discussion from all the audience. So thank you for your patience and thank you for your interest. And Gwen, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, just uh, a small um, advertisement. Um, some of you may know that I'm also Sorry, if maybe my colleagues could mute their microphones while I'm talking, then it's thank you very much. Less background noise. A small advertisement. Some of you know this already from previous webinars. Um, I'm also involved with the Life with Corona survey. It's an online survey. It takes about 15 minutes to fill in. And anybody who um, is listening, um, I would be most grateful if you could give us at some point after the webinar 15 minutes of your time, lifewithcorona.org slash survey. Um, and it, we're collecting data around the world. Um, to understand how people are coping with a pandemic. It's a really um, just a research project and we're collecting data to try to understand better how um, the pandemic is impacting, including on food security. So feel free to share that in your organizations and institutions, this link, um, non-for-profit uh, study, and we'll share all the insights widely. In fact, there's a lot of analysis of the data on the website Live with Corona. Next slide, please. But today is the session for the Home Gardens for Resilience and Recovery Network. It's a project funded by the German Science Ministry involving research institutes and NGOs from different countries, originally mostly from Asia. Now we've broadened out a bit to have African um, speakers in our webinar series as well. Because of the pandemic, uh, we've decided to go online. We held a um, workshop, it's already a while ago, isn't it, Hadija, um, in, in Bonn, um, which is also where we met. and. Um, so I actually find these online sessions also extremely helpful, less traveling time, less uh, carbon dioxide emission, and it, it allows to reach out to many more people than actual events, which um, you know, are always rather exclusive. So it's a network to understand how home gardens can contribute for development, how they can contribute, especially in emergency settings, especially in difficult settings, and especially to promote the research and, and knowledge uptake on, on small scale um, home garden farming as it's practiced by many families um, around the world. Next slide, please. Today, we have two excellent speakers, Dr. Hadija Mbana. She's a lecturer and researcher at Sukhoi University of Agriculture. And she uh, has obtained a, a PhD in agriculture and nutrition, uh, both from uh, Sukhoi University of Agriculture and from the University of Hohenheim in Germany. She also holds an MSc in Human Nutrition from Massey University in New Zealand and a BSc in Home Economics and Human Nutrition from SUA. And, and she's a real expert with lots of practical experience and excellent research experience combining sort of the practitioner research um, divide, which is wonderful. And then her colleague, Victoria Gowele, who's a lecturer at the Department of Food Technology. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Um, Victoria Gowele, lecturer at the Department of Food Technology, uh, Nutrition and Consumer Sciences at Sukhoi University of Agriculture. She herself also studying for a PhD at the moment at Sukhoi University and University of Bornheim. She holds an MSc in Human Nutrition and Rural Development from Ghent University in Belgium and a BSc in Home Economics and Human Nutrition from SUA. So two very highly qualified experts and I really look forward to both presentations. And um, I think uh, Hadija will start. And um, uh, with the presentation, um, I suggest we then have the second talk straight away and then the Q&A. We do aim to end at 3 p.m. in Berlin Sharp, so that's in about uh, 49 minutes. Um, feel free to use the Q&A feature um, for asking questions. Feel free to use the chat if you want to, to introduce yourself or to make general comments. But for the questions, it would help me a lot if you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you have any technical questions, Gwen will be happy to help you. Her email is shown here, moils at igzeb.de. And just to point out that the talk will be recorded and posted on YouTube. I hope that's okay with you all. And um, that way many more people can hear the presentations um, and the discussion, and we can help share knowledge on these important topics. So that's it from my side. Um, now over to you, Hadija, if you'd like to share your screen, please. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the inconveniences. My name is Hadija Mbwana uh, from Sokoine University of Agriculture. And today I want to uh, present a brief about a study that we did uh, titled Seasonal and Agroclimatic Variations in Kitchen Gardening. And we want to look at the impact on household data diversity in rural Tanzania. So 
just on a brief, uh, in uh, Tanzania and other developing countries, the nutrition situation uh, is usually characterized by inadequate attainment on the physical uh, dimensions of the body in children, but also for uh, poor micronutrient status for both uh, children and adults. And the main documented cause for this is uh, the inadequate dietary intake usually, which is coupled by uh, poor environmental sanitation. So at, as a national, uh, at national level, there are strategies that a country is taking, which involves supplementation and also fortification with different micronutrients. But uh, these ones are wet, but they, are, they have limitations and they are usually limited due to strongly relying on uh, international aid. And sometimes they cannot reach all at risk groups because all at risk groups are distributed differently in the country. So reaching all the groups is usually um, not uh, uh, complete, but also some co uh, conflicting logistics of delivery due to uh, infrastructure and uh, they usually target only subgroup of populations such as uh, children under five years and uh, women, uh, either pregnant or uh, breastfeeding or women of reproductive age. Uh, apart from this, but there are other alternative sustainable approaches that have been proved to work, for example, to uh, increase the consumption of nutrient-rich foods. This is a sustainable approach that uh, can usually work and can reach a larger population. So an example of this can be introduction of household kitchen gardens or uh, rearing of small or livestock animals at household level. So the work that I'm going to introduce uh, today or talk about is uh, just a small study under a larger study called the Transit Project. And the aim of the larger Transit Project was to improve food security uh, in uh, vulnerable poor populations. And this project was funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research and also co-financed by the BMZ. So uh, the location of the study was in uh, two regions in Tanzania, which are of different agroclimatic conditions. We have the Dodoma region, which is a subhumid region and also the Morogoro region, uh, Dodoma, which is semi-arid and Dodo, uh, Morogoro, which is the subhumid. So the two regions uh, differ in um, climates and uh, they represent different farming systems in Tanzania. So they are enough to explain uh, different farming systems because one is uh, semi-arid and another one is subhumid. So the methods used for our study, um, we included all household members, like we did not target only women, but included other household members, including men, the youth, and also the elderly. So the study was carried out in two seasons. We carried out, uh, we reached 240 uh, households during the rainy season and 200 households in, during the dry season in both regions. Remember, we were working in two regions of different agroclimatic conditions. And activities that were conducted in this study included uh, nutrition training, kitchen gardening training, nursery production for producing seeds for the uh, kitchen gardens. We carried out cooking demonstrations, family nutrition involving nutrition of different groups of people, and also data diversity was assessed in both regions, uh, in both uh, seasons, the rainy season, but also during the dry season to look at the differences between the two uh, uh, seasons. So we, uh, the total kitchen gardens that were established uh, for Morogoro region for both seasons was 168. And in the Doma region, which is a sub uh, semi-arid uh, region, we established 207 kitchen uh, gardens uh, with a total of 375 for both regions. So the other diversity uh, score this is, uh, in simple terms, this is uh, a simple count of food groups that a household or an individual has consumed over the preceding, for us, we use 24 hours. There are other periods that are being used by uh, different researchers, three days, seven days, but we use the uh, 24 hours. 
So this is simply the counting of food groups that a household has consumed. Okay, when we talk about uh, food groups, uh, for us, we involved 12 food groups. So all the foods were grouped in the 12 food groups. So we were asking a household if they consumed any one or two or more of uh, certain food from these groups. And what that the diversity score works, you count the groups. So the score tells you, if you have a total of 12, then it tells you that is the score that a household has consumed from a food group from different food groups. And then from that, we created what we call the agile diversity tables, as indicated. So there's uh, no uh, established guideline on how to uh, categorize the data diversity, but for the purpose of this study, a household that had consumed less than three food groups, we termed that as a low data diversity. Medium, it was between four to five food groups, and then high data diversity, more than six food groups. This is how we put it. So we assumed, or we, we regarded, we referred to those households that consumed four to five food groups to have a medium data diversity. And uh, reflect, uh, relating data diversity, household data diversity to uh, food security, uh, it is usually meant to reflect on a just on a snapshot, the economic ability of a household to access a variety of foods, because we are counting the food groups involved in diets of people. So it gives us a snapshot of the uh, ability of a household to access uh, certain foods. But also um, on a nutrition basis, individual diet diversity is meant to reflect on nutrient adequacy, how rich is the food that is consumed and the quality of the diet. And this is uh, from the FAO guideline. So uh, on a brief, what we found out, we were uh, having two regions of two different uh, agroclimatic conditions. As usual, all households in the previous 24 hours had consumed cereals or grains. But what we noted is about vegetables, which included also vitamin A rich uh, vegetables and tubers. During the rainy season in both regions, Majority of households consumed the vegetables, but the number fell and dropped during the dry season. Uh, for example, here we can see uh, more than about only half of the households consumed uh, vegetables in the dry season, but in the rainy season, majority did that. Another finding that was uh, very uh, alarming is the low consumption of animal source protein, which included um, meats, eggs, fish, and milk. These were lowly consumed in both seasons, in both uh, rainy and uh, dry season, but also in both regions, the semi-arid and sub, uh, subhumid regions, there was very low consumption of um, animal source protein. Regarding vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, also this was very lowly consumed as indicated here and marked in red in my graph. So uh, looking at the data diversity tetas, which I just explained how we categorize these with low and high, I will only talk about the lowest data diversity score and the highest data diversity score. When you look at the uh, dry, my key here indicates uh, dry season for Dodoma region. Um, during the dry season, a uh, very uh, a number, a large number of households had low data diversity in the dry season. But in the rain season, the purple color indicates the improvement because at least the households increased in the high, they moved from a low data diversity to a high data diversity. And this was uh, seen differently for Dodoma, uh, Dodoma and Morogoro. In Morogoro, which is the uh, semi uh, subhumid, had better consumption compared to Dodoma, which is semi-arid. And uh, at this table, I'll only explain some factors that we found that uh, influence the consumption uh, of uh, a number, a better number of food groups from households. For example, for households that had received uh, garden training from the transect project, our project, those ones, uh, this, so receiving nutrition training in gardening activities 
influenced uh, data diversity, both in rainy season and uh, in dry season in Dodoma, but not in Morogoro. So we see now the differences between the two uh, regions which have different uh, climatic conditions. For Morogoro, this one did not have any effect, but for Dodoma, which is a drier area in both seasons, receiving uh, kitchen gardening training influenced the data diversity in a positive way. And another aspect also is the participation in cooking demonstrations. We, we had very interesting sessions of cooking demonstrations. And this unfortunately showed uh, also uh, uh, to, to influence data diversity in the uh, Dodoma region and also Morogoro region, but only during the dry season. So you can see uh, this indicates that receiving, uh, the participating in uh, cooking demonstrations only for the dry season, not in the rain season. So this shows like, okay, during, maybe it could mean that during the rainy season, more food is available, more vegetables are available and people do not pay attention much to uh, the demonstrations because they have to cook anyway. But when they receive the cooking demonstrations and training during the dry season, it motivates them to include more food groups in their diets and thus influence. So, um, Another factor was just combining all the six vital activities also had an influence in the dry season. So you can see uh, focusing more, the dry season was the one which is, was more pro problematic, possibly because food is uh, less available during the dry season. So uh, what we say from uh, these results of this uh, sub-study of the larger study is that we see there's need for vitamin A rich vegetables um, and fruits to be the main components of uh, gardening uh, interventions because usually focus to uh, any available vegetables that the households can grow, but maybe we need more focus. For example, in our population, we saw vitamin A rich vegetables and fruits who are very lowly consumed, even with the training of uh, kitchen gardening. So another issue that can be of policy interest is the need to um, the, the need to look at the uh, availability of water, which is both safe and affordable, because if uh, water is available, even during the dry seasons, the, the households can still continue to grow vegetables. As we saw in our population, during the dry season, vegetables were less consumed, and even the dietary diversity was less during the dry season. So availability of safe and affordable water can also uh, uh, improve the uh, data diversity and also production of vegetables at household level. And another uh, comparison uh, in our study is that uh, we had more success in rural context, which is Dodoma, and fortunately, which was even the uh, semi-arid area. So uh, improving more or focusing more on rural uh, uh, households and uh, having them to grow more vegetables can have greater nutritional uh, impact compared to other areas in the context of Tanzania and also in urban, uh, urban rural comparison for developing countries. So that's all for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hadija. That's a, a very interesting presentation and thank you for sort of keeping it very focused and, and on time. Um, and I love the difference with the study sites. Yeah, I think that really gives a, a very interesting variation um, between different conditions and learning about the different uh, factors that are relevant. As I said, I would like to suggest we switch straight away to Victoria. And I'd like to invite you, Victoria, to share your screen and to unmute yourself. Maybe Hadija can mute so that we don't have any background sound. And maybe you can stop sharing, Hadija. Thank you very much. I am Victoria Boele from Tanzania, a lecturer at Sokwen University of Agriculture, but also a PhD student, currently doing my PhD in human nutrition. So today I will present to you uh, my presentation on the potential of pocket garden as one of the strategy to enhance vegetable production and also uh, improvement in micronutrient status. And this is from the lessons we have uh, 
seen from the field intervention we did in rural Tanzania. Next. So basically, this is uh, the study is part of a bigger research project, which was done in between 2016 to 2018, and uh, the project is Scaling Up Nutrition, abbreviated as SCALE-N, which uh, focuses on the development of nutrition-sensitive strategies to improve nutrition and health status of small-scale farmers in Dodoma and Morogoro regions in Tanzania. Next. So the pocket garden intervention aimed to enhance the vegetable production and improve micronutrient status, as I communicated earlier on. And this goal was addressed by implementing training modules regarding how to set up the pocket gardens. And also the project offered uh, the quality seeds to be planted so that uh, the farmers can plant them in order to grow the vegetables. Next. This uh, represents the areas which was covered by the project. We had two regions, that is Dodoma uh, and also Morogoro. But from those two regions, beginning with Dodoma, we had uh, one district, that is Chamuino, and uh, Zula and Chinoje villages. Can you In mute Morogoro, the other device, please? Adija, can you mute your device, please? We can't have two devices in the same room unmuted, and you have a massive echo. Mute. Mute. Sorry, Victoria, just a brief technical thing. And I can't do it. No, that's the wrong way around. You have to. <laughs> the device where Victoria is sitting should be unmuted. That works well. The device where Adija is currently sitting should be. OK. Yeah, the, there's one more device that needs to be muted, the one without the camera. And I can't do it for you, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay, keep trying. But it, it, yeah. It's the image. Worst case, log off, and because you're in the yes. same room anyway, you know. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> so, can I continue? Please do. Okay. So we had uh, two cross-sectional surveys. One was done during the baseline and the other one was done during the end line. And uh, in those two cross-sectional surveys, all the four villages were covered. Our study population included the mothers or caregivers, and we followed them up. A number of those who were followed were 580. We started with 666 households, but we ended up with 580. And also for children, we were able to follow 563. So purposive selection was done for the regions and for the two districts and the four villages. But for participants, random selection was done. Next. So during the baseline study, as I said earlier on, we had 666 households. And during the intervention phase, all the four villages were covered. Two main interventions were done under nutrition section. One was pocket gardening, which was done during 2017 to May 2018. And a total of 559 households were received the training on how to make pocket gardens. For nutrition education, which was done by my colleague, this was done between September 2017 to April 2018. And finally, the end line between July to August, 2018. Next. So for the pocket garden, these are some of the materials which are needed. As you can see, we have the mature animal manure, for example, a goat dung, and we have the pebbles. Next. Also, we need a, a rod to make a stem when you make a pocket garden. Water is also needed, fertile soil, next. And also you need quality seeds. For example, here you can see the Chinese cabbage seeds and also you can see the Chinese cabbage plants, next. Here are uh, among the steps that you need to follow when you make a pocket garden. First, you have to dig a hole 
And if you look around, you'll see a whitish material. This is ash. It is used uh, specifically to delay the effects of termites, because normally the termites can come up and eat the road and make the pocket garden unstable. Next. Here you can see the women in stage three uh, preparing the soil by mixing up. They mix both the manure and the soil together. Next. After the mixing, they put the water to make the soil wet. Next. Here, the pocket is taken and then uh, there is a, you cut at the center to make a hole. This is the place where you are going to insert the rod. Next. Here now, the, as you can see, the women are now filling the sack with soil that was mixed and making a central well of pebbles. Next. So here, the central well of pebbles is finished and the whole pocket has been filled with the, with the mixture of the soil. And now they are watering it to make it wet. Next. Now this is the process where they are now making the holes. And these holes are specifically the ones where the seeds are going to be planted. Next. Here now they are planting the seeds in the pocket garden and ready to wait for them to grow. Next. Here now we have our pocket garden. And normally you can, you can reach to this point when you have planted the seeds and then you stay for three weeks or we can say 21 days. And then they start to, you will find that it is already fully matured as you can see in the slide. Next. So here the woman has picked her Chinese cabbage from the pocket garden, preparing them for home consumption. Next. These are results from the key variables we used to assess, especially to compare what uh, the, between the two periods during the baseline in 2016 and during the end line in 2018, after the intervention of pocket gardening. As you can see here on the proportion, which is given in percentage, the prevalence of anemia for the children decreased from 41.6% to 28.8%. Also, the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency, which we, we assessed using retinol, this one decreased from 24% to almost negative, I mean, to almost zero point. So we really see a very significant change. And this was also, uh, we tested it uh, statistically and we found a significant difference between what happened with the prevalence in 2016 and the prevalence in 2018. But also we further assessed the uh, number of households that reported to grow vegetables during the baseline and after intervention to see if there was a change or not. And we found that there was an increase in number of those who reported to grow vegetables from 76% to almost 82%. And also the awareness about pocket gardening increased from 21% to almost 92%. We also asked for those who really practice the pocket gardening. And we also see a, a change whereby the number increased from three to 76%. Next. So why do we encourage the pocket gardening? They have their potentials. First of all, they require minimum amount of land and less amount of water. And you do not need specific technical knowledge to prepare a pocket garden. Once you, uh, you, you, you receive just a basic training on how to prepare, following the steps on how to prepare, you can be able to prepare your own pocket garden. 
And also by placing them near the household, they save time and energy going frequently to the market. And also they save money. And uh, pocket gardens allow diet diversification, so they can help in addressing the problems of micronutrient deficiencies. They can also be uh, implemented in an urban area setup where land scarcity is a problem. Also, they can serve as a source of income to the households, and thus they can contribute to poverty reduction. Next. So we have seen the potentials, but also in the field, we face challenges. And sometimes these challenges can hinder the, the farmers to, to, pro, to produce their uh, vegetables in, in pocket gardens. And so, first of all, water scarcity. We worked in Dodoma. Dodoma is very dry. And in the areas where we were working, they had really a problem of water. And so, uh, water scarcity is a big challenge because sometimes if they don't access water at all, it's a problem. Also, as you can see in the picture, vegetable pests and diseases. The pest can destroy the vegetables. Lack of proper fencing is also a problem. Wearing out of the bags, theft sometimes can happen, and also the limited arable soils can be a challenge. Next. So what we conclude from our study is that if we implement the nutrition sensitive interventions such as home gardening, but integrating with nutrition education together can contribute to improved micronutrient status. And we should not forget that community involvement is an important parameter for a successful intervention. Next. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation for today. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. That was a really nice presentation. Actually, I really enjoyed it and it was very well illustrated. And I really um, enjoyed seeing also these pictures because I think if you had just described it in words, it would have been difficult to um, imagine some of this, yeah, and like to make it very down to earth, literally speaking, pun intended, yeah. So um, what I would like to say to all those of you who listened, and I appreciate so many of you stayed online, that we will post maybe an edited version of this video um, with the presentations um, on YouTube uh, shortly. We will post the slides, if that's okay, with the presenters, yeah, because they're very informative. And we will post, finally, um, a document where we address the questions that have been asked. Now, either Hadija or Victoria, have you seen any questions? We have sort of like two or three minutes left and I find it really hard uh, to now pick out, um, you know, to pick out one or two questions from the many questions we had asked. Um, huh, but Carol Lambert is asking a question I had wondered as well. How did you assess anemia and VAD? Did you, you know, did you take uh, blood samples? Um, could you yeah. maybe comment on that briefly? Because this is something that we haven't had in previous seminars, yeah? So that's a, that would be very interesting. Maybe you could comment briefly on your methodology there. Okay. Anemia was assessed using uh, the whole blood because we used the venous blood from the children and we assessed anemia using uh, hemoglobin levels. For vitamin A, we also used the blood, but not whole blood. We did the centrifugation, so we assessed the serum retinal levels. Okay, thank you. Um, was that um, difficult to organize and practice, or you know, did you find it quite? Maybe you have a lab in the university, but or did you have your own lab, so to speak, or, or colleagues' labs? Okay, we collected the samples from the field, and then we kept them here at the Sua lab for storage for a few days at a very low temperatures, minus eighty degrees. And then we transported the samples to the laboratory at the Hohenheim University in Germany for analysis. Oh, okay, okay. So that's a bit more complicated. Yeah, <laughs> that's the sort of thing you do for a PhD, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, Sanka is asking a really interesting question. What was the participation of men from the community? I think that was actually on the first presentation. But you know, anyway, I'll ask you as well. You are, we have the sound up and running, so you get to answer all the questions, Victoria. Okay, so participation of men was uh, also included because we trained the households. We didn't train the women only, we trained the households. 
So even mm. there were some other members of the household who were also invited to participate during the training. But uh, because our sampling units were women, and uh, that's why the, we, we reported what the women has reported in a, during our survey. But men were also involved in the training. Glad to hear, yeah, it probably, how did they say it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a whole household to feed it, yeah, so that's good. Um, now, several people are asking about sustainability, you know, um, and, and I guess sort of, you know, what's, what's the story beyond the end line, yeah, do you have any sense of what is continuing? We are planning to disseminate the intervention to also the nearby villages. Mm -hmm. That's what we are planning to do, because there has been a spillover of uh, knowledge. Those who are trained, they also tend to educate others on how to produce the, the pocket gardens. And for them, this, uh, they, for, for the spillover for us is a benefit because we trained a group, we can say a small group, but the knowledge goes to other areas. Yeah, okay. Because you know, it's one thing people starting in a project with a lot of help and encouragement and enthusiasm, maybe, and it's another thing to see if people continue these practices, right? So one yeah, colleague sure. asked, uh, our, our, our discussion is a bit spread across the chat and the Q&A now. I haven't quite managed to keep everybody in the Q&A, but, but some people are asking about the cost you know, um, um, of the whole thing, the pocket garden in general, but then the different inputs, including pesticides. You know, it's, is this an issue? I mean, can people afford this in the long term? Of course, they are following. Sometimes even we keep contacting them on, on if they continue doing the if they continue with the practices. And we during the training, we also encourage them that they can be able to even access the seeds at low cost, especially yeah. yes, at low cost in the in the local shops, the seeds are available. Sometimes you can just buy a, 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 a tin of seeds. And they are so much so that you can not use alone. So they share. They can buy maybe a tin of 50 grams together and, and use maybe in two to three households. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank that you very much. Yeah. And um, is there looking across the you know, if you look across the room, do you see her teacher? Does she want to say anything else? Any, yeah, she any sort of final <laughs> comments? Is there anything either of you want to? You know, comment on having heard these questions and having done these two very interesting, inspiring presentations. Um, any final thoughts you would like to share, either of you or both of you? Yes, Hadija is also here with me. She can also share something. Oh. Hello. Uh, what I want to share lastly is that um, for both uh, looking at uh, uh, ex interventions of nutrition, most of the interventions don't look at the agroclimatic conditions. They just implement without comparing the same intervention being implemented in different, uh, uh, different settings of different climatic conditions. But this should be looked at uh, and see what works better where. For example, for us in Morogoro, which is subhumid, the interventions did not work very much because they have rain, two rainfall seasons per year. They produce other vegetables. So producing vegetables was, was not their main, uh, their main need. But for Dodoma, which is dry, the vegetables were their very best need and they practiced it and the intervention did very well. So for policy uh, and people uh, intervening for nutrition, they should look at the conditions and the need of the people. That's all I want yeah. to say. Thank you. thank you, Hadija. That's a very powerful and very clear message. And I think that's a great closing statement. And um, I think it's actually a point that we weren't able to make in previous um, HG4R webinars as forcefully as you have made with your study, which accounts for these two different settings. So that brings us to the end of the time we have. We'll be back with material online. And in fact, we'll be back with another webinar. Gwen, if you can share the last uh, slide. Um, just to announce it, uh, the next webinar, 18th of May, we'll share by email the details. If you want to be on the mailing list, please drop uh, Gwen an email at Moyles, that's her surname, at igzev.de, IGZ being one of our employers. So that's where we manage this project from. So we look forward to being in touch with you. I've seen several comments also in, in the chat saying, you know, can we stay in touch? Yes, you can. Let us know by email. 
um, and we'll also upload multiple materials as I've explained earlier. Thank you again for uh, both uh, to both Hadija and Victoria. And thank you for everybody who listened and who stayed online through some technical problems. Apologies for that, but I think we had a really good discussion around home gardens in Tanzania. Thank you for your inputs on that and have a wonderful day, everybody, and stay healthy, please. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>